You know, language frames how we think about things. So clearly this coronavirus and this plague that is on the whole earth right now, we're all thinking about it and talking about it. I wonder to myself, how many billions and billions of conversations are oriented around this thing that we're going through? And how we speak about this thing shapes how we think about things. For example, a phrase that I often hear in response to the situation in which we're now is that we are living in uncertain times. It's a great phrase. That phrase focuses our attention when we use that on the future. And it should be a reminder to us that in the midst of what we're going through, we are not in control. But as we talked about on Palm Sunday, Jesus is king and he is in control of all things. And if he has already told us that the future has with it, coming with it, wars, rumors of wars, plagues, earthquakes, those sorts of things. When we say we are living in uncertain times, it should be a reminder that they are not uncertain to God. And so whereas that language focuses on the future, it helps remind us that God is in control of the future. Another phrase that I hear people use when we talk about what we're going through is that we are in uncharted territory. Another good phrase. This focus is not on the future, but on the present. It's a recognition that we are walking around in new territory. We don't know where we're going, but it should be a reminder like we talked about last week that in the midst of this uncharted territory, what we need our teachers, to teach us and to guide us and to show us the way and that we ourselves are all becoming teachers in the midst of this pandemic. But it's also a reminder that during the present, God is teaching us. God is teaching us so that we can teach others. There's a third way you can kind of frame what's happening and what we're going through. And that is, you can say, we are living in historic and unprecedented times. That statement focuses not so much on the future or the present, but the past. And it's a recognition that what is happening right now is historic. People are going to write books about this, seeing the entire economy grind to a halt, watching this pandemic hit the entire world at the same time. Uh, All that is going on right now, this is historic and in some ways unprecedented situation that we're in the midst of. But in the same way thinking about the future draws our attention to God and thinking about the present draws our attention to God, so too we have an opportunity when we think about the past to have our attention drawn to God. And so what I'd like to do this morning is focus on that third situation, the fact that we're living in historic and unprecedented situation and hear what it is that God has to say to us in the midst of these historic times in which we're living. Now we've been going through the book of Titus. And in Titus chapter two, we were due this week to be talking about mentoring. In Titus two, Titus talks about older women mentoring younger women. And Paul talks to Titus about being an example to the people in his church. And so we were scheduled to be talking about mentoring how you and I need mentors, how we should be mentors. And so on Monday, I studied for a sermon on mentoring. On Tuesday, I wrote a sermon on mentoring. And by Wednesday, the Lord had made clear that he had something different in mind for us this morning. So I threw away the sermon from Tuesday and with much earnest prayer, and I know many of you were praying for me and so I so appreciate that, I wrote a different sermon. And it's the sermon I think God wants us to hear this morning. The idea of mentoring became the seed, but instead of sort of thinking about how we mentor one another, the Lord led me to talk this morning about how God has provided for us, mentors if you will, but role models from the past 
and that all of us have an opportunity to look back to those who've come before us. You see, we can say we are living in unprecedented and historic times, but we're not the only ones to have ever lived through unprecedented and historic times. And one of the blessings of the past is that God has provided role models for us to look to to see how did they behave during historic, unprecedented situations. As a role model for us today, how should we behave? And so what I have for us today are four role models from the past. And I'd like to just cover those four, hearing what God might have to teach us about how we should live in the midst of historic, unprecedented times in which we find ourselves. So role model number one, it's a man named Joshua. And Joshua lived at historic times. He was the leader of the children of Israel. And the reason it was such a historic time is that he was leading the children of Israel into the land God had promised Abraham. For hundreds and hundreds of years, Abraham's descendants had been living in Egypt. Moses led them out of Egypt to the edge of the promised land. When it was time to go into the promised land, God raised up a man, Joshua. And Joshua's job was to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. It was indeed historic, unprecedented times. God moved in mighty ways. The city of Jericho, the walls fell down, not because of the army's great power, but they simply marched around the city blowing trumpets and trusting God, and he did an amazing miracle. The sun even stopped in the sky during one of the battles because Joshua cried out to the Lord saying, we need more time. It was miraculous, historic, unprecedented times. Well, near the end of Joshua's life, he recounts for the people of Israel. He gathers all of Israel together. And he begins to recount to them their history. And he reminds them, we are living in historic times. And then he says this to them in Joshua 24. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And what Joshua teaches us is that at historic times, historic times are times for making significant decisions. These are the times for making significant decisions. Joshua took a look, takes a look around him and he says, God is on the move. He has done unprecedented historic things and Joshua realizes now is the time to decide, to make a choice. And this is what historic unprecedented events cause us to do, to choose right now. You and I are watching a world in which government officials are trying their best to manage the pandemic in which we find ourselves. We are watching a world in which the medical community is doing their best to help care for people in the midst of this. We see a world in which technology is trying to overcome the social distancing and to help us engage with one another. We are looking at a world in which scientists are trying desperately to find a vaccine. And I pray earnestly that all those things will happen. But I am reminded that I am praying to God for those things. And today is a historic moment in which you and I have a choice. And I say to you in the words of Joshua, choose this day who you will serve. If it's government or science 
or technology or medicine. If those are gods, then serve them. But my plea and my observation would be that despite all our best efforts, there is still a plague on this earth. And that God himself has sent something that we are powerless to stop. I do pray, but I pray for God's mercy exercised through these various means to give us relief from what we're going through. But please don't miss the object lesson. Now is the chance to see if science and technology and medicine and government and economy and money, if those are God's, choose them. But as for me and my family, we're choosing the Lord. What I've seen over the past two months has not shrunk my view of God, it has raised my view of God. It has caused me to realize he and he alone is God. I have seen him in the midst of this. When humans are powerless, God provides guidance. When humans are unable to help, God provides help. When humans are unable to provide comfort, God provides comfort. I think about the fact that many high school students and college students have been robbed, and it is a painful thing, of graduation ceremonies, commencement, opportunities, school, sports, all of those things. But in the midst of that, let me also point out, you have been given a really great gift. There is great loss, but the great gift is this. You're getting to see firsthand and having an opportunity to make a life-altering choice. Really, this is what every commencement speech is trying to get college students or high school graduates to do, to make a choice. And God has thrust us into a historic situation, and what historic situations do is force us to choose Many of us would just be sleepwalking through life, pursuing these gods of economics or work or success or sports or whatever it may be. And what this pandemic has done is given us the opportunity like Joshua to say, choose this day who you're going to serve. And high school students and college students and middle school students and senior adults and whomever, this day choose. Because historic situations call for historic choices. And so my plea to you today is choose. Choose who you're going to serve. Everything I've seen over the past couple of months have said God is real. This is not a joke. He's not playing around. Death is a reality. Plagues do happen. And our one hope is God. And so Joshua reminds us, historic Moments are moments to make historic choices. The second role model is a woman named Esther. Esther also lived at unprecedented historic times. She was a Jewish queen of Persia, but she had kept her identity secret at the urging of her cousin Mordecai. Well, during that time in Persia, an edict had been announced a plague, if you will, that was going to bring death to all the Jewish people. An evil man had plotted to kill the entire Jewish race living in Persia at the time, and an edict had been accepted to do that. Well, Esther at first wants to do nothing. She wants to say, she's safe, she's a queen. Nobody knows she's Jewish. And she's remaining in the palace silent, not speaking out about what's going on. And her cousin Mordecai comes to her and he says this to her. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your fam father's family will perish. And then I love this verse. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. What Esther teaches us in the midst of historic situations, historic situations are the opportunity 
to engage. They're the, I give us the opportunity to feel solidarity with others who are going through the same struggle that we have. You see, in many ways, it would have been easy for Queen Esther to just stay in her palace. She was actually quarantined, if you will. As a queen, there's just, there's lots of stuff she couldn't have done. She could have simply said, well, what can I do? Mordecai says to her, look, and this is the lesson for historic, unprecedented situations. Look, you can let this pass you by. You can try to hide. But God is on the move. And if you don't choose to participate, he'll find somebody else who will. But you and I will miss the blessing of being able to do something. You say, well, what can we do? Well, you can make masks for other people. You can buy groceries for other people. Uh, You can give money to those who might be struggling. You can write notes of encouragement to those who are having a difficult time. And you can do the most important thing, the only thing that Esther could do. See, like I said, Esther was under quarantine. And we may think, you know, in West Michigan, we're sort of safe. And we might think in our homes, we're just fine. And we might think, as long as I don't go outside, this situation will pass me by. As long as I don't engage with anybody else or do anything else, I'm going to be okay. That's what Esther was thinking. And Mordecai came along and said, hey, look, Don't miss the point that this is an historic moment and during historic moments, God is moving. And if you don't participate, you're gonna miss seeing what God is up to. And so Esther does the one thing that's available to her, the thing that no quarantine could ever take away, the most important thing that anybody could do at any historic moment. She fasts, she prays, and she goes and asks the king to do something. That's what we're doing, except our king is not a Persian king. It's the king of the universe. You see, during these times of quarantine, it's easy to just simply watch Netflix or to do puzzles or to play games or go out for walks or enjoy the rest. And all of that is good. Please, please don't miss that this is a Sabbath rest from the Lord in many ways. But also don't swing the pendulum back too far the other way. This is a time for prayer. It's a time to fast. It's a time to cry out to the Lord. And even if you can do nothing else, this is the thing to do. And to simply let days slide by with entertaining ourselves and trying to keep our attention and listening to the news. Historic moments are opportunities for historic actions. And I already told you in point one, people are choosing today. Today is a day they're choosing. You and I ought to cry out to the Lord, God, come and save these people. God, open their hearts. It's it's a time to fast. It's a time to pray. It's a time to beg the Lord, do something. Esther is begging the king to reverse the edict. We too, you heard Bruce lead us in prayer this morning. We can pray for scientists. We should pray for them. We can pray for government officials. We can pray for those in the medical community. But we are praying to God, God, come and do something. And that is the most important thing that we can do. And if this whole situation passes us by, and you and I, like Esther, hide in our palace, what we're going to miss is the chance to participate with God in what he's doing. Example number three comes from the more recent past. I wanted to choose at least one non-Bible example to remind us that God's spirit is not just at work during Bible times, but God's spirit is always at work and he's been at work throughout history. And so the third example comes from a man named Charles Spurgeon, who was a pastor in England in the 1800s. He's, we are not the first people to live through a worldwide pandemic. He lived through the cholera pandemic. And he recounts a little bit of his story as he comments on Psalm 91. This is what he says. Before expounding these verses, so it's in a sermon on Psalm 91, Charles Spurgeon says, I cannot refrain 
from recording a personal incident illustrating their power to soothe the heart when they are applied by the Holy Spirit. In the year 1854, when I had scarcely been in London 12 months, the neighborhood in which I labored was visited by Asiatic cholera, and my congregation suffered from its inroads. Family after family summoned me to the bedside of the smitten, and almost every day I was called to visit the grave. I gave myself up with youthful ardor to the visitation of the sick and was sent for from all corners of the district by persons of all ranks and religions. And then he says, I became weary in body and sick at heart. My friends seemed falling one by one and I felt or fancied that I, (coughs) that I was sickening like those around me. A little more work and weeping would have laid me low among the rest. I felt that my burden was heavier than I could bear and I was ready to sink under it. You know that feeling, don't you? I do. As God would have it. I was returning mournfully home from a funeral when my curiosity led me to read a paper which was wafered up in a shoemaker's window in the Dover Road. It did not look like a trade announcement, nor was it. For it bore bore in a good, bold handwriting these words. And here he's quoting Psalm 91 in the King James Version. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. The effect upon my heart was immediate, Spurgeon says. Faith appropriated the passage as her own. I felt secure, refreshed, girt with immortality. I went on with my visitation of the dying in a calm and peaceful spirit. I felt no fear of evil, and those verses in his window, sorry, and I suffered no harm. The providence which moved the tradesman to place those verses in his window, I gratefully acknowledge. And in the remembrance of its marvelous power, I adore the Lord my God. I felt compelled to include this example, especially for the first responders, for those in the medical community, for those working in grocery stores, for those working in retirement homes, for those uh, delivering food, for those working in police uh, force, Uh, for those in government, for those are all who are having to continue to work during these times. During historic moments when we are engaged in important actions, please be reminded from the example of Spurgeon that righteousness guards the heart of the one who is doing what is right. Maybe you will receive just such a promise like Spurgeon did, that the plague will not touch you. Maybe God will give some other word to your heart. But in the midst of this, the example is, when you do what is right during historic moments, God is with you. And in the moments of despair and discouragement, in the moments of if you too are in the hospital and you think all of these sick people coming through, how am I not going to catch this? The Lord might speak a word to your heart to encourage you. And the point is, is during historic moments, God is on the move. And the safest place for anyone to be is doing the right thing. And if you're serving where you're called to serve, if you're doing what you're called to do, if you're working where God placed you. You are not in that grocery store by accident. You are not in the healthcare industry by accident. You are not a first responder by accident. God placed you in that retirement home. God has put you where you are for just such a time as this. And the example of Spurgeon reminds us, if during historic moments you are doing the right thing, you're gonna be just fine. I'm not saying you'll never get sick. I'm not saying you won't die. 
I'm saying that during historic moments, God is watching closely. Will you do what is right? And if you are doing what is right, you will find from the Lord a word of encouragement, a word of help, something to get you through. Fourth and final example is the most important example of all. It's Jesus. And when we think about living through historic, unprecedented moments, the most unprecedented moment in all of human history is the God of all the universe hanging on a cross, dying as an innocent person for our sins. It's unprecedented. There is no one in history that Jesus could look at, no one after Jesus that looks anything like that. There is no point in human history that even bears a close resemblance to this. Jesus, the Son of God, who himself knew no sin, was made guilty of all the sins of all the people that have ever been committed. And at that moment on the cross, he is bearing the sins of the whole world and God the Father turns his back on him. And Jesus cries out, my Father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There is no moment like it. It is the turning point of history. It is the most unprecedented, most historic moment. And what can we learn from the example that Jesus left us at that most unprecedented of moments? First Peter 2 tells us this about Jesus at that moment. If you suffer for doing good and you endure it, This is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. And then here's the verse. Instead, He entrusted himself to him who judges justly. The problem with unprecedented times is that they are unprecedented. We can look through history and find people in similar situations, but every historic situation is unique and every unprecedented experience is unprecedented. There are things about this experience worldwide that have never happened before. There are things about us going through this where we've never been through anything like this before. And when we look at the example of Jesus, we see what is most important at these historic moments. When Jesus is hanging on the cross and there is no parallel for what he's going through, when he is in a situation where even God himself is silent to Jesus, what does Jesus do? He chooses to believe. He entrusts himself to the one who judges justly. Historic situations require historic faith. Unprecedented situations require unprecedented faith. And when Jesus, who has no parallel before him or after him, is bearing the sins of the whole world at that moment that he is guilty of all wrongdoing that's ever been done, in which nobody could ever even come close to having done anything like that, at that moment when heaven refuses to speak to him, his last dying words on the cross are, Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. And when heaven is absolutely silent, Jesus shows us, I choose to believe. I choose to believe that God is good. I choose to believe in God's unfailing love. And I believe at that moment that Jesus is hanging on the cross, I don't think he can see through death. 
I think he's got a lot of promises. But I think at that moment, in his humanity, no one's ever been guilty of ever, every sin that's ever been committed before. How is heaven going to respond to all these sins? And at the moment, God is silent. And Jesus says, but I know whom I believed in. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him. And so he chooses to believe. The problem with historic moments is they never unfold the way we think they're going to. The problem with unprecedented moments is we're never prepared for them. And there'll be some moment in this pandemic that you simply feel like your spirit is broken. You feel overwhelmed. You feel that heaven is silent. You think there's no way we're getting out of this. And at that moment, you might not get a reply from heaven. You might not get a word of encouragement. You might not get a solution to your problems. But the example of Jesus is, God still loves you. He will not abandon you. He is faithful. And you can choose to entrust your life to him. Four role models from history. They leave us with the question that I want to leave you with. It's actually framed from Deuteronomy 11. In Deuteronomy 11, Moses says to the generation that's listening, you are living through historic times. And he says to them, it's not your children or your grandchildren that are going through this. It's you now. And so I say to each one of us, these are historic moments. This is our moment. This is not for our children's generation or our grandchildren's generation. This is the moment that we have been given. And the question to us is, what example will we leave to those who come behind us? looking to the models who came before us, that historic moments are opportunities for making historic decisions. Will you make a decision today that will affect your eternity? Will you make a decision today that will change the course of your life? As you look around and decide, if God is God, follow him. If the plague is God, follow plagues. If science is God, follow them. If the medicine is God, follow them. If government is God, follow them. Today might be the day you make a decision that will change the course of your life, your children's life, your grandchildren's life, and future generations. This is that moment. This is the moment for action whether it is being a good neighbor, whether it is being generous, or whether it includes doing the most important thing and fasting and praying and engaging with God. This is that moment. This is happening in our generation. It's happening now. This is the opportunity that if you are called to do what is right, to do what is right and to trust that God is going to protect those who are doing the right thing. This is the moment. Will you choose, even if heaven is silent, to continue to have faith, to believe in God's unfailing love? Years and years and years from now, you may remember very little about 2019. You will never, ever forget 2020. We are living in historic, unprecedented times. Choose, act, do what is right, and trust, and leave behind for those who come after us. Stories that will echo throughout history and for eternity. Let's pray together. Thank you so much for joining us for this podcast from Calvary Church. We hope this message has brought the light and hope of God's presence into your life, refreshing your soul for the journey the Lord has you on. If you have a spiritual need or would like to connect further with the work God is doing through Calvary Church, 
seek us out online at calvarygr.org. On our website, you can also find an archive of previous messages